फास्ट स्पिन क्यूबिट Good. Let me try one last thing, which is see if this works. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Shankar, for having this, uh, for being honored in this way you know, that I can participate in. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this talk is about uh, two new pieces of data. So there's good news and bad news. The good news is that it's uh, stuff you haven't seen before. Uh, the bad news is that uh, it's not polished yet. There might be mistakes. There might be things I can't remember because the student took the data, etc. But but that's part of it being new data. So I think uh, it's mostly good. Uh, this is work that was carried out. Uh, the measurements were all carried out in the lab at Harvard before I moved to Copenhagen. And the, the principal experimentalists uh, for the work that I'm going to talk about today were Jim Medford, Johannes Beal, uh, Ferdinand Cumit, and Andrew Higginbottom. Edward Laird laid some of the foundations for this uh, previously. And we had a lot of help uh, on the theory side. And of course, uh, the materials, as uh, Jim said the other day, without these materials, we couldn't have done any of this. Um, and without the money, we couldn't have done any of it. This last initial, I think people know about uh, these uh, intelligence and defense agencies, National Science Foundation, Harvard. And this is a new one for many people, the Danish National Research Foundation. But they've been sponsoring the work since uh, the group has moved uh, to uh, Copenhagen. <coughs> there will be four topics in this talk. Two of them are just reviews to get you up to speed on uh, the way we do business. and. Uh, Two of them will be the new data that I talked about. So the, the last two topics, uh, namely using many electrons uh, to make a spin qubit, uh, and the, in the last, uh, using um, a three-spin system to make a fast, uh, fully controlled qubit, uh, will be data that you haven't seen before. And you know, one could imagine combining these two into some logical uh, qubit. We haven't done that yet. So this field. And the way we formulate it was started by Daniel Loss, David DiVincenzo, and a group of other theorists who suggested that the exchange interaction between a pair of electrons would provide a two-qubit operation uh, that would be sufficient as long as one could control the spins of a single electron, uh, the spin orientation of a single electron, would be sufficient for uh, universal quantum computation. That is, that these would be the necessary ingredients for one and two qubit gates. And it was nice that it took advantage of a naturally occurring interaction uh, that required relatively little engineering. The engineering was simply only that the confined electrons needed to be able to be brought into some contact with each other so the tunneling could occur between those two confined regions, and that that would affect the two qubit gate. Uh, in a way that would produce uh, uh, the necessary ingredients for this. And, and many experimentalists uh, took this as a call to arms and, and started building uh, the corresponding systems. And uh, the kind of work that we've been doing in our group, and you, you, you know uh, uh, Mir Jacobi and many other groups around the world have been doing similar things, um, Delft and Tokyo and other places, uh, involve in this particular case, the gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide heterostructure system with electrostatically defined gates patterned using electron beam lithography. So this is the, 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 the pain that Michelle was talking about, that we have to put down lots of gates in order to make the confining potential. We can't use the nucleus of an atom to draw the electron in. But once we've put down the gates and can make uh, boxes, we can uh, usually relatively easily confine a small number of electrons. And it took a little bit of uh, ingenuity um, to get the, the, those numbers down to the ones and twos. But now that that's been accomplished, uh, it seems like one of those things, to be honest, where you say, well, what was so hard about this for so many years? It now seems to work much more uh, readily. And maybe it's just the confidence that knowing that it's possible. Uh, but now it's readily achievable to get down to the small electron number in these relatively uh, clean materials. The chips, if you haven't seen one of these things, looks like this. This is the gallium arsenide chip. And on the surface of that are a bunch of lithographically defined gates. The, the largest structures on the gates are just big enough that you can put down one of these kind of sewing machine wires to uh, connect to these gates that go out 
to the room temperature controls, uh, one of the things that you can notice is that most of these gates are connected to a certain kind of gold plate. It, this is a macroscopic scale. This thing is something that you can hold in your fingers. It's about four millimeters by four millimeters, this piece. Two of the gates are connected to coaxial lines via those solder joints. And so those are the ones that go fast. But otherwise, they're connected in just the same way. But down inside of this structure is the more microscopic part of this thing, which goes down to the micron scale where these confined uh, structures reside. So now the review parts of this talk are to remind you that over the last decade or so, there's been a huge amount of work in realizing, I would say, the Los Di Vincenzo program. And um, the, the, the first uh, work and, and uh, best known of, the, of those pieces of work came out of the Delft lab. And here's an example of really just taking the, the Los Di Vincenzo program. Literally, they make a double quantum dot, oops, sorry, in which the exchange interaction uh, can be controlled via uh, the gates. And what this, this uh, uh, experiment demonstrated, the first part of the challenge, namely the individual control of rotating single spins inside of the box. So it didn't perfect the, uh, the, the exchange interaction. It perfected the other part, which was controlling the single spins. And it did it by applying a microwave field at precisely the Zeeman energy, which created an electron spin resonance. And it did it in a way that took, that took two high-profile papers to achieve. The first high-profile paper was to do it literally by putting an oscillating magnetic field down and doing just what you would do if you were doing electron spin resonance. And the second important paper, which is this one, was one in which they realized that a spin orbit coupling would be enough to affect the rotation by putting on just an oscillating gate voltage. So just the moving of the electron back and forth in an environment with spin orbit coupling was sufficient to make the electron rotate. And here you see, as a function of the duration of the burst of microwaves, the oscillating current that flowed through the device in this spin blockade configuration. I won't have time to explain in detail, but suffice it to say that you can create a situation in which an electron can or cannot go into a level depending on whether or not its spin orientation relative to another spin is either has a singlet component or doesn't. So by, ro by rotating it around, the, the overlap with the singlet is a yes, no, yes, no, yes, no as it rotates around. And that yes, no, yes, no is reflected in the oscillating uh, current as a function of the burst time. You might ask, by applying this kind of global microwaves, how did they know which one they were rotating? It was only the relative spins that were, that were being oscillated. And that was addressed in a subsequent paper from uh, Sego Teruch's group in Tokyo, in which he put a slanted magnetic field across the two devices so that each of the two electrons were in a slightly different magnetic field, which meant that one of them resonated at one frequency and the other one resonated at a different frequency. And so you could control the left spin by matching this frequency and you could control the right spin by matching that frequency. So that was clever. That was a good way of turning, turning space into frequency and then doing multiplexing in frequency so that you could identify things in space. It's a heck of a lot easier than trying to aim a microwave at the left dot and not having it shine on the right dot. So these are examples of the kind of cleverness that you can think of when you are faced with this problem of taking something like one electron and trying to make it rotate, but not make the one next to it rotate. Don't say impossible. Just think of something clever like this. And then you can do that. And, and in a way, this is sort of a metaphor for all of the impossible things that we have so far done and the many, many more that we have yet to do, we're not going to do them by brute force. We're going to have to think of clever things or it's never going to work. So next clever thing. Next clever thing was to recognize that the, the two-level system in the two-electron system created by these two states the singlet state of two electrons or the triplet state of two electrons, because those can be different in energy, that's also a perfectly good two-level system. And that two-level system also constitutes a qubit. So this so-called singlet-triplet qubit or two-level qubit took advantage of the fact that electrostatics could very easily spill the two electrons into one box, which made the singlet-triplet splitting large, or it could separate them into two boxes and make the singlet triplet splitting small. 
So insofar as that single triplet splitting constituted a direction of, of, a, of a force in the problem or a, a, a direction of rotation, you could control it just using fast gates. And so the, the system got much easier to control uh, with this. And importantly, much easier to initialize. It took advantage of the fact that one of the states of the system was the natural ground state of a configuration that was easy to get to. Namely, by spilling the two electrons into one box, the ground state of the system became the singlet, and it was a great state to start from. You remember from these uh, ingredients that were necessary for uh, a quantum computer, one was to initialize the system. And so here's a way in which the ground state was the natural initialization of the system. So now, the, the, the re-envisioning of the two-level system not being spin up and spin down as it was in the Lost DiVincenzo program, but rather the singlet and m equals zero triplet state splitting off the other two by applying a magnetic field, uh, gave two axes of control. The two axes of control were the exchange, which I just mentioned. The exchange coupling is what separates uh, what, 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 that, that is uh, turned on and off by tilting the experiment. And uh, we could initialize the system by starting off in the singlet in what we'll call the prepare state down here in the O2 singlet configuration, then move to a separated state where the exchange coupling was made much smaller, and then finally move back to a measurement state where we could see whether or not the system was in its singlet or not, and we could read that out in a charge measurement. The complexity of this problem was that there was another field in, the, in this uh, that went perpendicular to this direction, which was created by any magnetic field gradients. Now, that seems OK. It seems like you should be able to prevent a magnetic field gradient on a few micron scale. If your magnet is far enough away, you shouldn't have a magnetic field gradient. But what was discovered soon after all of this, you know, and frankly, it was in the literature, but let's say experimentally discovered, was that the nuclei of the circuit was make uh, of the chip itself was making its own magnetic field gradients and those hyperfine couplings once the the two electrons were separated made a field which caused precession between the singlet and t0 states and here you can see in a fast readout experiment how as a function of how long you let the system sit with the exchange off you would find the singlet triplet singlet headaches i'm sure as amir will tell you but essentially it's like the first brilliant act with the magnetic field gradients is to recognize that by being a little clever, something which originally looks like a problem, a decoherence mechanism, actually turns out to be very powerful for controlling the device. From the original paper in which we, together with uh, Amir and Misha Lukin and uh, the theorists who were involved, reported these data, I put up, uh, this is from Jason Petta's uh, paper in, in 2005. Uh, an interesting experimental result that was kind of late in the paper. If you weren't very interested in the paper, you probably fell asleep before you got to this part. So I'll remind you of what happened in this part of the paper. What happened in this part of the paper was we initialized the system into the singlet state. You know how to do that now. You put the two of them into the one bucket, and they have the singlet as the ground state. So that becomes the ground state, so it's easy to initialize. Then we very slowly ramped down into the ground state of the nuclear field. By moving slowly, adiabatically, with respect to that nuclear gradient, we could load into the state which was the nuclear ground state. And then you could sit there for a long time, because you were really in the ground state of the system. You could sit there for a, a T1 time before the system relaxed uh, down into a, a, a spin up, up configuration. But then turning on the exchange interaction, the system would rotate around its axis because you turned on exchange, exchange between these two. But for this perpendicular orientation, the system would begin to process around this direction. For however long you left the exchange on, you could then adiabatically move out. And if the system was in this configuration, it would go to the T0 state. If it was, on the other hand, over on the right side, namely in this ground state, it would move back up to the singlet. And you could use that as a readout technique for this kind of what we called at the time Robbie precession around the axis of this block sphere controlled by exchange. Now, what was the interesting result was, well, it worked. That was nice at the time. And it, and it fit the model pretty carefully. But what was a little bit puzzling to us, and it really sat as a puzzle for a long time, was that it was pretty easy to change how fast it spun around. You could make it spin slowly by not turning on very much exchange at all. 
Or you could make it spin very fast by turning on lots of exchange. But no matter whether we made it go around with a 10 nanosecond period or go around with a 1 nanosecond period just by changing the amount of exchange coupling, it always seemed to go a few wiggles and then die. It didn't seem to mind whether we made it go fast or slow, as if whatever was killing the effect was growing in proportion to how much exchange we wanted to put on. So if you characterize this by a quality factor, how many wiggles you get before it dies, it seemed that the quality factor was roughly invariant over a couple of orders of magnitude of the speed of the precession of the device. And we didn't understand it at the time, but we moved on. I'll come back to that problem when I move to this many electron version of the problem. So now enter our, uh, our honoree, uh, Shankar Dasarma and his team. Y you know, it's easy to miss a Dasarma paper because, because if, you just, if you just laid out all the papers from, I don't know what year this was, 2011. You know, if this one was toward the bottom of the stack, you'd never get to it. So, you know, for a lot of people who weren't working directly in this field, and maybe some of the authors themselves, <laughs> the paper, you know, is somewhat obscure. Not that it was published in a bad journal or anything, but just, you know, it, it was a wash in Disarma papers, let's say. 2011 was another good year, and uh, uh, you might not know this one. So let me remind you of the key result of this paper. Uh, and. And the key result of the paper, I've underlined. The title also sort of implies it, but let me just read you the last line of the abstract. Uh, we show that the sensitivity of a multi-electron qubit to charge noise may be an order of magnitude smaller than those of the two-electron qubit. That's a pretty important statement. So here's a multi-electron qubit as modeled by these authors, parabolic confinement, where it comes to a point in the middle, and they argue that the point doesn't matter, et cetera. And what they show is that as they start loading the device with electrons, the interaction between an, an, two impurities, in this case, uh, inside of the device, uh, as a function of this normalized, how much does the exchange interaction change when you move an impurity around, gets screened when you have a lot of electrons. Now, it's not surprising if you have 14 or so electrons and you move an impurity around, it's gonna, give, it's gonna be screened. And, and we can tell you that one of the difficulties with, you know, let me just finish my sentence, one of the difficulties with making a few electron devices is there's just not much screening around. Any, any garbage in the bare potential is, is, the, is the garbage that the electron sits in. It's nice to have a rough potential, add a bunch of electrons, and then have a very smooth surface of the Fermi C. And that's what this paper was arguing would be the case. Addy? It does look that way. And Yeah, there there could be a there could be a uh, magic number yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah, there is a magic number. Yeah, we we have, we have we have a still lo longer paper which we have been working on for two years. This is numerically extremely good. This is quantum chemistry. So the interesting thing about these dots are they they don't mind having more electrons in them. In fact, they like it. They're much happier with a few electrons. You know, these days, anyone can make a double quantum dot with 15 or 16 electrons in it. It's getting one or two that's still the hard part. So it was easy to take the two electron quantum dot, and instead of putting one electron on each of the two sides to make the, the singlet triplet qubit, to put another pair of odd numbers on the two sides so that there was a spin a half on the two sides. In this case, seven and, uh, seven and five. And you could initialize it the same way by going to uh, f either 4 and 8 or 6 and 6. We went to 6 and 6. Separate the two. You have two spin a halves. And what's extremely surprising is that those Rabi oscillations that we showed from the PETA paper in 2005, which reproduced here pretty much the same kind of way, 
looked a lot better. They really seem to be uh, improved in this device. It's the same chip, same refrigerator, same cool down, just changing the electron number. I wish I had for you 2, 12, 20, 50, 100. That's the right way to do this. I don't have it. So I'm doing it semi-wrong way. OK. Anyway, to, to uh, give you a little bit more detail, the same kind of experiment, a slightly different quantum dot design using a sensor that was itself a quantum dot and uh, a, a process that was very much like before, initialized into the singlet, uh, moved down adiabatically into the ground state of the nuclear system, turn on exchange for some period of time, uh, ramp back out adiabatically to map the nuclear ground state and excited state onto the singlet and T0 states, and keep track of the Q or the effective Q that you've seen. So now there's a lot of detail, and, and maybe it's not worth memorizing it, but maybe just there's a spirit of what I'm trying to say right now in this, in this view graph, which is that under certain models, in fact, how this Q behaves as you change the exchange, this thing that was roughly constant in the PET experiment, which seemed improved here, tells us something about the noise spectrum. For instance, if the noise spectrum is modeled as a 1 over omega to the beta noise spectrum, you can learn about beta from how this thing asymptotes. That when beta is greater than 1, it asymptotes to a flat line. When beta is between 0 and 1, it goes downward, including 0 where it goes strongly downward. This yellow one is for a white noise. If, if the noise was white, then beta would be 0, and, and you would get a curve that fell like this. In fact, for this, this is how it falls off. This is how the, the quality factor of the oscillations falls as a function of beta. I want to draw attention to the fact that there is on the archive now a rather similar analysis, slightly different system with different knobs, etc., cetera, uh, from Amir's group uh, with Oliver Dial as the first author of that. So I'll draw your attention to that. Then, not surprisingly, if you go all the way to this end of the scale where exchange is very small, so that you try to make the system go around very slowly, then finally the nuclear contribution becomes significant at the, at the low J end and erodes your Q back down to zero, not, not surprisingly. That is, when, when you're rotating around J and it looks like a straight vector up to the sky, however long it is you rotate. If there's noise on that vector so that when you rotate around, you sometimes go a little too fast and sometimes go a little too slow, that's, that's what constitutes these ends. And the power spectral density of how that vector is growing and shrinking is what determines these asymptotes. But on the other hand, when you make that vector shorter and shorter and shorter, the transverse vector, which is the nuclear field, begins to make that vector wobble because now it's being added in quadrature to that vector that's pointing out to the side. So you get this second effect down here, and eventually as that vector becomes shorter compared to the, the nuclear, the typical nuclear transverse vector, all hell breaks loose and you lose your Q entirely. That's the spirit of this thing, and if you want to memorize what they are as a function of beta, that's, that's up to you. But what I wanted to say was that we can just explicitly measure in these experiments, it's pretty straightforward because the thing does go around in proportion to J. So if you just measure the frequency, you can just measure how J depends on this tilt parameter, how far you put it. So here's for the, both the 7-5 experiment and the 1-1 experiment, here's a couple of different ways of measuring this exchange coupling as a function of the tilt that you use to make the thing go around. Here are two different measurements. One by seeing where a certain intersection between the Zeeman split T plus line crosses the, uh, the um, singlet line. That gives the black marks. The white marks, which are, in, which are in agreement, are from simply measuring the frequency of this thing, which is another measure of J. And this is for the 7.5, and this is for the 1.1. One, one. Now, what those give you are the key parameters for uh, understanding how this um, a Q factor, the quality factor of the oscillations, depends on exchange. And here's the important feature that we see as the difference between these two. 
What I wish I could tell you right now is that this was always the case. What I can tell you is, is that the 1-1 one, one system, which we've been now studying for years and years, always behaves like this. It always goes bad Q at low J because of the nuclear problem. Then it goes up and there's a kind of a maximum J. Then J gets a little too long and the noise erodes it depending on the power spectral density of the noise. And in our case, it, it looked like this. Now we knew everything about J from this, from this particular curve. So there's only one parameter, which was the total, which was a fit parameter, which was the total integrated noise. Everything else was determined. The nuclear noise was determined from a T2 star experiment, uh, the, the whole shape of everything. And there's the measurement of Q as a function of J, and there's the, the model that follows it. It has a nuclear contribution and an electron contribution. For the 7-5 experiment, not only was it a higher Q, but its characteristics were different. Namely, it was still getting better as J went larger and larger. Now, now that's an important distinction because you'd love to be able to say, well, if you're dephasing, just speed up the experiment. But you couldn't speed up the experiment previously because you'd run out of, you'd run out of J. Now, in the dial paper that I mentioned down here, there's a clever technique that Amir has introduced in which if you go all the way over to 0, 2, then you flatten out the, the, uh, the derivative of the exchange, and that also brings the thing back up again. But, uh, but without doing that, this seems to be happening automatically from screening. No theory to support it, just a self-consistent model that goes up like that. Shankar? Uh, my guess would be uh, that this would be eventually like that, but the peak would be way up. It will saturate eventually. It does. We have higher frequency data. It eventually saturates. But in the range of operation that we care about, it's still going up. Okay, some other things. If you add deliberately add jitter to the experiment, if you understand the experiment, you should be able to predict how this Q value should go down as you add jitter. No parameters left. You already know how the system is responding to noise. You've measured dj, d epsilon, how the j fluctuates. And so you don't have any choice left. You just have to take the data and hope that the curve comes out somewhere near it. So with no free parameters, that did OK. And, and, and basically, doesn't inform us too much, except to say that we sort of understand what the source of noise is, noise is in the system. That's all I want to say about many electrons. I want to finally go to the title of my talk, which was a fast qubit, and tell you about this exchange-only qubit. Now, you might think that I'm, that I'm going in a logical sequence where I would say, well, we studied the one electron qubit, and then we studied the two electron qubit, and now I'm studying the three electron qubit, and you can probably predict what I'm going to do next. But you'd be wrong. Because three is not just the next number. Three is where you need to get in order to have full control over two axes of the block sphere. So with three, we have full control using exchange, and we can stop there. So let me say a little bit about how this works. Here are now three electrons trapped by these gates, and here's a sensor which is used to read out the system. On the left side, when the two electrons are over here, this diagram of levels looks pretty much like the two electron model with some third guy hanging out over here that's not doing anything. Similarly, if we go over to this side and we put the two electrons together over here, this looks like the other diagram that we had before, only with the, the other guy hanging out on the other side. Now you just have to make a symmetric picture because the whole device should be symmetric. So you take what this looked like with singlets and triplets before, the same thing with singlets and triplets before, and you make a symmetric picture out of it. Okay. Then you work a lot harder and you get the actual quantitative values. But essentially you can see that there are these states which can be initialized just like they could before, if you want to initialize over here, in the 201, that's 2 over here, none, 1, or over here in the 102 state, you can put the system back in the middle and call these the two level systems that you can initialize. Now, what's so good about those two level systems? Why did we need the third electron? The block sphere of this system, where I've indicated 0 and 1, 
is now this 0 and 1. Here's the ground state. Here's the excited state. And the exchange interactions created by turning on this exchange on the left or this exchange on the right constitute two directions on the block sphere. So now if I want to rotate an initial state this way or this way, I just move the system to the left and turn on this exchange, or I move the system to the right and turn on that exchange, and I don't need anything else. Because I can get from anywhere to anywhere on this block sphere using two rotations. And I can turn them both on and off as I wish. So I'll just go quickly. Here's the diagram of where all those levels were found as a function of millivolts and control. And here I can start in 201, dip into 102, let the system oscillate because this initialized singlet is now touching the other electron. And I can see that as the farther I go into positive country toward 102, the faster I oscillate. I can just model it because I know the diagram now and the model comes out in good agreement. I can do it the other way. I can make the singlet initially on the other side. So here's starting off with the singlet on the right. Now I move up. And now the further I go this way, the faster it oscillates, etc. So the system is behaving as it should, and I have now full control over the two systems using exchange on the two sides. Yeah? It, it, gets, it gets rid of that. Maybe, maybe I can say it turns it back into a bad guy again. You know, now it's something that you can get rid of. The, one of the difficulties with the, with the nuclear gradient is it's hard to turn on and off quickly. You have to make the other one bigger or smaller. And I guess I would say a better way to say it is that this is an alternative. I mean, that's working OK. But this one just seems to have all of it done in exchange. Let's see if this does something better. OK. One thing you can say is it's damn fast. Here I'm initializing, and as a function of how far I go toward the other side, you see when I go just a little bit and then come back, I can rotate by pi, or 2 pi, or 3 pi, or 4 pi, or 150 pi. But I can do those rotations in 1 nanosecond, 1 1.6 nanoseconds. So exchange is a very fast rotation. Now what's interesting about this is you see where the most j for a small amount of change of tilt is. It's right here in the middle. Because the more I go, the faster I rotate. The frequency went up. And the frequency went up because dj d epsilon was large. You remember from the previous discussion, though, it was dj d epsilon that was precisely our decoherence. If there's any noise in the system, it's dj d epsilon, which is proportional to that noise. So not surprisingly, where the frequency is highest, the amplitude is lowest. There's more decoherence here than there is out here. And in fact, if you just plot the, the visibility or the amplitude of that oscillation, when djd epsilon is large, like here with the green spot, or here with the light blue spot, the amplitude is correspondingly less. We know djd epsilon. We put the same model back in of noise. And with no adjustable parameters, we get the same curve. Oh, sorry, one adjustable parameter, which is the overall value of the noise, which sets where the, where the curve goes. But there's no other choice over the curve. So all kinds of tricks can now be performed. And, and if you really do the modeling well, then you know, it's, it's easy to understand. For instance, if you just put in exchange noise, you get a curve which looks like that first dashed line. If you put in a combination of Nuclear no if you just put in nuclear noise, you get a curve which looks a little better. And if you put in both together, you get something that just describes the data beautifully. This is how long you've separated as a function of, um, uh, or sorry, uh, the, the visibility of the initialized singlet as a function of how long you've separated. The asymptote should be one third if you've leaked out of the original basis state, etc. We can do some kind of echo like object where we can initialize and rotate by pi. It's not a full echo, because it's only echoing the two left guys. To really do an echo, you need to do a kind of a braiding, where you take the left two and change them, then the right two and change them, the left two and change them, the right two and change them. We haven't done that yet. But a, but a kind of a cheap echo, a half echo, just on the left, uh, seems to extend the time out somewhat. It's still in the hundreds of nanoseconds, 
Uh, but it agrees pretty well with the simple model, all the parameters taken from up there, and just applied to this echo model, and finally some other kinds of experiments. Yeah? S say it's... No, there's no nuclear polarization at all in this. No intentional nuclear polarization. There's nuclear fluctuation noise, but there's nothing active being done with the nuclei at all. We're treating them as an enemy again. Last point, he signaled to me that I'm out of time, but I want to say that there's another way to view this, which takes us all the way back to the original loss of Vincenzo idea, which is to put ourselves in the middle. And you'll remember there were these two vectors that went out this direction, to the left and to the right, these separated by 120 degrees. But if I think of those as, as adding up to a vector in this direction and having a difference vector in that direction, then I can sit right in the middle of this state space. I can sit right here. And I see that there's a gap. And notice if I wiggle back and forth, that looks like an oscillating transverse field. It's the difference of exchange fields that oscillates transverse to the large field. And if I get the magnetic field right, or sorry, this is, this, this is set by exchange in this case, then I can oscillate back and forth and drive this transition. So it's a gapped transition, which is a now a high frequency qubit. And here you can see all these different transitions are all visible. The little circle indicates something analogous to the singlet T plus. And here are those two lines. And, uh, Etc. I can see where this gap is as a function of the, uh, the bias voltage and the frequency. And um, you know, essentially, everything works. I can see now, in fact, as a function of frequency, as I tilt back and forth, here's the main resonance. But I can also see a two-photon process and a three-photon process. And I can see the processes over here where these two cross. And I can even see some branches coming off to the side, which are these small features where I can drive that splitting by frequency. And in fact, a model of the, of the effect just reproduces exactly what's going on. So now it's like a lost DiVincenzo qubit where I have to apply an oscillating field, but the oscillating field itself is exchange. So I can change the frequency. I can change the power. I can even do spin echo experiments. And I can look at the scaling of how CPMG goes. OK, I mean, it's starting to get a little bit like we can, we can do everything that we want. The reason to show this last view graph is the scaling of echo with the number of pulses again tells us about the, nuclear, about the noise environment. Only this time we get a funny result that we don't understand. So I want to leave you with something mysterious, which is when we do the analysis following some previous work in which the exponent of the scaling is related to the exponent of the noise, we get a result that we don't understand right now. So there were these three possible qubits, the loss to Vincenzo in which we needed to apply microwaves, the two electron singlet triplet qubit in which we could apply simple pulses. It was much more effective, but a gradient was needed. That gradient could either come from permanent magnets or from nuclei. And finally, if you were willing to pay the price of having three electrons, you could do it all with gates, but you had to suffer the fact that there were three electrons. And I think that it's fair to say that this is a kind of progress report on where the field is right now. We are agnostic as to which of these approaches will ultimately be the most effective. And it's fun to kind of have a friendly competition between whose, whose version of the spin qubit is working best. Ultimately, the problem is going to be making 5, then 50, then 500 of them. Now, which of these wins that contest? It may be none of them. It may be some other thing entirely. But at the kind of level of 0 to 10 qubits, or let's say 1 to 10 qubits, I think that all of these things ultimately could probably be implemented up, up to that level. The real game is going to be, and it's going to be the same game for ion traps, it's going to be the same game for the superconducting qubits, how to get from 10 to 1,000. And I think it's fair to say that nobody knows how to do that in any of, in any of the realms. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Yeah. Well, I mean, no matter 
Phasing mechanism is still the nuclear defacing. What's the what's the dominant defacing? Well, so I think that what what I tried to illustrate was that depending on the regime of operation, right. it can either be electrical noise with its own particular broadband characteristics, or it can be nuclear noise. Yes. So okay. uh, I didn't draw particular attention to it, and maybe I can just say one thing now. Uh, one advantage of this last qubit design, why go to AC? Right. You say, oh, I was going along fine. I was pulsing. Everything was rotating around. All of a sudden, I introduced this thing where I have to go back to applying microwaves. Sure, I could do it with, all with exchange, but what was the point? The point was I can gap out nuclei now. Yeah. If this is bigger than nuclei, then nuclei are out of the problem. Okay? Yeah. Mostly out of the problem. So I think that the idea is that whichever noise you're suffering from, it's going to be the one you didn't get rid of. And now it looks like by various tricks, either by feedback control or by gapping it out, we can take care of nuclei, I would say. That leaves electrical noise in its own broadband characteristic. And that's, I think, the answer to your question, which is right now the, the big bugaboo is broadband electrical noise. So, fine. If you can take that out and then you use uh, Shankar's recipe of creating a larger number of electrons, yes. and then you can should be able to get rid of charge noise as well. At some That's point. right. The charge noise gets screened away right. pretty effectively. Nuclei are gapped out or fed back out. No, but isn't it more, doesn't it get more and more difficult to get precisely an odd number, or seven, five, or what is this? It's no, as Addy Stern has said many times, the great thing about numbers is every other one is odd. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many of them. Uh, do, I, do I quote you approximately correctly? <laughs> <laughs> Why, what stopped you going larger? Moving to Copenhagen. All right. so, the fridge was cold, the experiments were underway, and we said, time to shut down the fridges. The Oxford guys are coming in two days. All right. So you, do you, have you worked out theoretically, though, at what is the maximum number you can go to before? So Shankar will tell you that these numbers in the tens are a sweet spot, and the price that you pay as you go larger is... That the, that the level spacing shrinks. Yep. However, Shankar was using a parabolic model, which means that as you add more electrons, the dots get bigger. Now, I think our dots look more like a tuna fish can, okay? and that as you just add them, they just fill up. So I think the truth is somewhere between a parabola and a tuna fish can, and, and I'm more optimistic that the numbers will go higher because I think the walls are, are harder than a parabola, and that that might have been an artifact of the parabolic assumption. But we don't know right, right. now. No, we, we, I do know because on once the paper is posted, you'd know also. Okay. So um, we are collaborating with the Sandia group to do truly huge numerical work using their Jaguar machine, where we are even modeling the actual confinement potential through density functional theory first. Okay. So, for instance, if the device was at ground zero of a nuclear right. explosion, you gates. would know what would happen. We, yeah, we are putting the gates. No, we are putting the gates. We are not, start, we are not starting with the model potential. We are putting gates, yeah. calculating the actual confinement Great. potential first, both for silicon and for gallium arsenide. And, but, you know, this is time-consuming. And so what's the answer? The answer is that there is a number, and the number is still of the order of 20. Eventually, the energy level separation has to go down. You, obviously, you cannot have like 10 to the 23 electrons. I do this. Yeah, yeah that's okay. right. So the number, I don't remember what it is for silicon. For gallium arsenide, it's the order of 20. So, so let me answer like an experimentalist, which is that as long as KT is much less than the single particle level spacing, you're in business. Eventually, that's what, it's a very mundane thing that kills you, which is simply that the level spacing, by virtue of the large dot, competes with KT. And that's it.